Hello and welcome back to Magic Coverage with Lock Daddy featuring Mythic Championship 4 Day 2 Modern. Alright, let's uh let's jump right in. I'm I'm fairly curious to see uh what decks are gonna come out and who's gonna be in the top eight, so uh let's jump right into it, shall we? This is uh round twelve. Yep, this is when the uh constructed rounds begin. Uh, the modern constructed rounds, they've already done the draft. There's always three rounds of draft at every Pro Tour. Well, Mythic Championship. Here we go. Hello, Misha. How are you? Hey, girl. And it looks like we got Tron. He's the German Tron player. Versus Jund. Riley sucks. <laughs> Riley Knight's one of the commentators or one of the like yeah he's one of the like uh commentators slash like floor spotters I think they like they like take turns doing different things but uh, he's the British one so <laughs> the Europeans are like he's like that's funny alright turn one chromatic star ooh it looks like he mold to five but uh, fortunately for Tron, it mulls incredibly well. Uh, Frank Karsten actually crunched the numbers, and he said even like on a mull of four, they still have like a 30% chance of winning or 35% chance of winning, something like that, which is like really high. Like no other deck can boast those odds or those uh, win percentages on four cards. All right, he's got Tron. He's got the mine in hand. It just shows you the power of this deck because the deck's so redundant. It's just gonna, you know, do its thing. Get the Tron combo out. Ren and six. This is the new all-star of Jund. A two-mana planeswalker that can plus one to get a land out of your graveyard and return it to your hand. Minus one, deal one damage to any target. And minus seven, I believe. It's either minus seven or minus eight. Ultimate that gives all your sorcery and instant spells retrace, which retrace lets you recast the spell from your graveyard if you discard a card from your hand. So. You can just retrace lightning bolts, and then in tandem with his ability to get lands back, you can just keep getting lands back, retracing spells, just grind your opponent out of the game pretty easily. It's a, it's a high value version of Jun. It also plays Blood Raid Elf now, because Blood Raid was unbanned, what, about six months ago? Maybe a little longer. Six to eight months ago? Maybe even a year. I don't remember how long it's been when they since they unbanned Blood Raid and Jace. It's got to be close to a year now, if not a year. Uh, both haven't really like impacted Modern that much. A lot of people thought they would, but they're both for forecasting cost spells. So, especially with Modern being such a fast format right now, All right, it looks like Tron just has Warm Coil. He's got a Walking Ballista in hand and a lot of mana. It's like he assassin trophy his tower, but he found another tower. Or he already, I think he had two tower. He had another tower in his hand. So Jun not in the best spot. He's got abrupt decay and fatal push, both which will not kill Worm Coil Engine. Worm Coil Engine is one of those creatures that one of the very few creatures that you know fatal push can't take care of that Lightning Bolt can't take care of, that Dismember can't take care of. Like, between all the creatures in, in Modern, there's Worm Coil Engine, uh, uh, 
What are the other creatures that, that the normal removal suites can't take care of? There's Warm Coil Engine. Uh, oh, uh... Primeval Titan. That's also a 6-6. And it's in Valakut and Amulet Titan. Um, and that's about it. Those are, like, the two main creatures that are, like, 6 toughness that can't be killed by, like, Dismember or Fatal Push or Lightning Bolt. And no one's really running Terminate anymore. Like, Terminate's, like, not being played. And that's one of the only things that can kill these, these big high casting cost creatures. Just straight up removal. He's got Blood Braid. It's another Ren and Six. Yeah, he doesn't want to replace that other Ren and Six. It's already got six charges on it. Walking Ballista with five counters, I believe. Yeah, he's just going to scoop him up. Oh no, he just wins, actually. He just shoots the Blood Raid, hits him for six, and then shoots him for the other two. Yeah. Here's his list. So, four Inquisition, two Thoughtseize. Ooh, three Tyler's Tracker. This is like super, super value, Jund. Four Liliana, four Ren and Six, two Surgicals, two Fatal Push, one li three Lightning Bolt. Yeah, not very much removal. Even with not. Oh, it's using four Assassin's. Or three Assassin's Trophy. Okay, I guess Assassin's Trophy can get rid of those six drop creatures. Ooh, he's playing Vraska Golgari Queen main. That's interesting. And just one Blood Raid Elf. Okay. Three Tireless Trackers. That's crazy. And then how many... He's playing Baron Moor. That's for that's because of Renin 6. The, the Cycle Land. He can just bring back Cycle Lands and then cycle and draw a card. Uh, one Nurturing Peat Land, which is one of the new Canopy Lands. The black-green one. Where you can pay one colorless, tap it, sacrifice it, and draw a, a card. And then one Tranquil Thicket, which is another cycle land. Um, only two Black Cleave Cliffs. Wow, two Black Cleave Cliffs got cut from the deck. It used to play four of. That's interesting. That's really interesting. So these decks are definitely more vulnerable to like burn style strategies. Or like Mono Red Phoenix. Oh, let's look at a... Ooh, four Worm Coil Engines. That's new. For Tron. Uh, one all is dust. That's new too. Three O stones. That's standard. Two Ulamog. Two Ugin. Four Karn. That's standard. All the rest is pretty standard. Three walking ballista. That might be a little bit weird. They usually play uh, what is it? The green guy. Uh, the green Eldrazi. He's not playing any of those. Three relics main. That's I guess that's pretty standard now. But yeah, all is dust main is pretty weird. And four warm coil engines. That must be this must be to fight Hogak. That's definitely because of Hogak. Having the warm coils. Alright, and then, yeah, two black cleave cliffs. That's really crazy. Really cut down on, uh... And then, what, two forests, two swamp? And then four basics. They used to only play... Th oh, one, five basics. Wow. Jun used to only play three basics. Uh, two swamp, one forest. Alright, game two. Um, turn one, Inquisition. Ooh, the zoom in cam. Yes, Urza's craft work. Yes, that's the name of Urza's power plant. Craft work is power plant in German. That's cool. Um, what did he take? Took uh, Sylvan Scrying. He's going to play Ophi. The Ophi. Activated abilities of artifacts can't be activated. This is the creature 
version of Stony Silence that just came out in Modern Horizons, and he's going to dismember that real quickly. Get that out of here. Plays Relic of Progenitus. Good graveyard hate card. Yeah, Jund has traditionally had a really hard time against these big mana decks. Tron just doesn't really care about the value that Jun can make. It can make bigger things, bigger, badder things. It can do more powerful things. And it doesn't really care about how much value the Jun deck has. It'll just go right over the top of what it's doing. Cast Sylvan's Crying. Get a mine. Unfortunately for the Tron player, though, the Jun player has an Assassin's Trophy in hand, and I believe he has a Ghost Quarter in hand, which is probably a sideboard card. I'm not sure. Yeah. I didn't see in their main deck that they play Ghost Quarter. It's probably sideboard. Uh, for for these matchups, maybe he just has. Maybe they just include one main deck. Maybe I just didn't see it in the lands, because Ren and Six. You can just keep bringing it back with Ren and Six, and sooner or later it's going to be like a wasteland, because they're going to run out of basic lands to fetch with it. So, it's another way to utilize Ren and Six. And he's keeping his opponent's graveyard exiled, using the relic every chance he can, because the Jun deck does play four Tarmogoyfs, which benefit from different card types in the graveyard, <coughs> as well as scavenging use. If he gets rid of all the creatures and scavenging use, can't eat creatures and get bigger. Okay, during his draw step, he's going to kill the power plant, so if he does in fact have a tower in hand, he can't utilize the mana. Plays a Blast Zone on one. Blast Zone, really good magic card. <clears throat> it's like an engineered explosive, but it's a land. It can't destroy zero cost creatures because it comes in with one counter, but. Or it can't destroy zero cost permanence, <coughs> which is a, a mild restrictor on it. But he's going to be able to get this on two counters and just, you know, two for one, kill both creatures with it. Right, he's going to exile his own graveyard or his own a card from his own graveyard so he can shrink down the Tarmogoyf. Actually, he's just going to use it. Just sacrifice it, exile all graveyards. Take zero damage from the Tarmogoyf. Ooh, Liliana the draw. Great draw. He's going to trophy the Blast Zone, I think. Yep. Good call. He's pretty safe with the Tron lands. He's only got one in play. 
And he knows he doesn't have a second one in hand, so... The only problem is, is he's hitting his land drops every turn, so soon he's going to be able to just hard cast these without having Tron. I mean, he has five lands now. And Sylvan's crying, so he's going to go get a Tron land. And if he plays Ugin, it's just like all over. He's going to play Liliana on his next turn and make him, and tick it up, make him discard a card. But if he draws, if he gets Tron next turn, he's going to play Ugin and just wipe the board, exile everything. And the Jun player is just going to be, oh, nice. Okay, he's going to take the Ugin, 100% he's going to take the Ugin. Karn he can actually deal with. Karn is not like a full board wipe. And he has two of them, so obviously he's not going to take Karn, but... Oh, he has an Emrakul, the Promised End. That must be sideboard. That's the new Emrakul that... Uh, costs one colorless less for each... Or one of any color less for each card type in your graveyard. And then when it comes into play, you get to take your opponent's next turn and basically play their turn. You get to see their hand and you play any cards you want from their hand with any targets that you want. You basically essentially have own their turn, which is very powerful. Oop, he found he found map. He's not gonna get to play a threat this turn though. He can go get the land, play it. Oh, he's at four. Okay. GG. Yeah, he was able to put enough pressure on him. He couldn't assemble Tron. <laughs> Hogak versus Phoenix. Alright, game two. Turn one star into turn one Thoughtseize. Ooh, Mulligan to five against hand destruction. Feels so bad. take his other chromatic star he's trying to prevent him from assembling Tron he doesn't want to take the threats he'd rather him just not assemble Tron oh he drew, draws Fulminator Mage that's a good draw yeah, he's, and he's got an Assassin's Trophy in his hand yeah he's in a really good position to win this game he's got a lot of ways to destroy Tron lands oh, he's got two Fulminator Mages damn so yeah he's got three ways to destroy lands yeah I don't think the Tron player is going to win this game Oh wait, never mind. The oh no, he didn't miss land drops. Did he? Miss... No, he's got... he didn't miss land drops. Okay. Oh, he's surgicaling. Okay, so now he can't assemble Tron. Yeah, this is probably... I mean, he has a Spatial Contortion. He can kill, like, a Scooze or something if he plays it. And then maybe cobble together, like, f you know, three more land drops and play a hard cast of Worm Coil, which is very strong against, you know, most decks. Unless you have a, an easy way, like, Path to Exile. Or Path of Exile. Path to Exile. I always get, I always call it by the video game name sometimes because there's Path of Exile, which is the video game, and Path to Exile is the magic card.
Oh, two more land drops. If he hits two more land drops, it, it could be really bad for the the Jun player. And it looks like the Jun players. Oh no, the Jun player just hit a land drop. That was a good top deck. All right, he's gonna be. Able, he's probably gonna play Liliana here, make him discard. Or maybe he just plays Fulminator Mage. Probably Liliana. Oh, he's gonna play Fulminator, kill the Blast Zone. Oh yeah, I guess if he plays Liliana, he can just kill the Liliana with the Blast Zone. Now he's gonna play Liliana probably. Oh no, he's gonna play another Fulminator. Okay. He's just like, I don't want you to have any lands, dude. Look at this land destruction. He's killed three lands so far. That's crazy. Now Liliana's just gonna like destroy his hand. He found someone's crying. What's that new sideboard card that came out of the new set, M20? If your opponent plays a black card or blue card, all your creatures get hexproof and you draw a card. Or you and your creatures get hexproof. You and all permanents you control get hexproof. It's pretty strong. Yeah, I don't think the I don't think the Tron player can win here. Yeah, he's a threat now. Oh, he thought he was playing Sylvan Scrying for a second. And he picked up his deck and started looking through it. <laughs> oh, shit. He just used Veil of Summer to give himself Hexproof, so Liliana's ultimate can't target him now. That's awesome. That's really cool. He actually has, like, an out here, maybe. If he draws a land here and plays Thrag Tusk, he could actually maybe make something happen. He needs to draw a land here right now, though. Oh my god, he draws a land. Let's go. Claw on his way back. If he gets up to six lands, then he's got a lot of action that he can play. Thrag tusks and warm coils. He's got two warm coils left. Probably two or three thrag tusks.
Who is gonna get rid of Lily to kill Thragtus? That's interesting. I mean, he does have a six-six skew, so. I mean, he needs to he needs to draw like land and worm coil, or another thrag test would work. Or actually Oblivion Stone would work too. Okay, he's got six lands. Now he can top deck Worm Coil, Thrag Tusk. Wow, this game is really close. Really close. Oh, he's just drawing lands too. This is like the opportunity that he needed to get back into this game. He's down to three. If he rips a warm coil or a thrag tusk here. Land. Okay, now he can rip Karn too. So he's going to block with this piece. Okay, it's all about these next two draws. These next two draws are going to make or break the game for either of them. If the Jun player draws removal, really any action, Lightning Bolt, Fatal Push, Liliana, Blood Braid. But if he draws a land, or a hand destruction spell, okay, he draws Goyf. It's a good draw, but. And now he's got two lethal threats. But. It's all about this top. Actually, Karn won't save him now, so he needs to draw Thrag Tusk or Worm Coil. Uh, someone's crying. Not gonna do it. GG. Wow. Jun takes out Tron. That's a uh, that's a first. Not a first, but it's very difficult to do. <laughs> John Finkel, of course, you're on Hogak. And then he's on Urza. Let's see who wins this game. Did Hogak win? Yep, Hogak did win. It's turn three. This is turn three. Or four. Three or four or something. It's absurd. Of course, they're not going to ban Hogak because they want people to buy their Modern Horizons packs. They don't want to, like, jeopardize their, like, merchandise sales at all. But they should ban Faithless Looting. I think that card needs to get banned. It would make, it would make all these graveyard decks significantly worse. Like, not bad enough to where they were, like, unplayable, but, like not top tier anymore. Not like the tippy top tier anymore. Alright, we got Mardu Shadow versus Jund. Yes! This is an awesome, awesome matchup. This is round 13 coming at ya. Thoughtseize. What is he gonna take? Probably a Goyf. Oh, he's got a Russian Goyf. Boom. Dmitry Butakov. Is, is that Ukrainian? Dude, so you can read that. Boom. The Russian. He's got multiple Russian cards, yeah. Oh, he's taking Lightning Bolt, okay. Perhaps he has a creature in his hand that can be killed by Lightning Bolt.
Everyone's using these new cool sleeves, like with planeswalkers on them. These sleeves must have just come out. Or those are the sleeves they gave to them. They probably give you sleeves when you go to a pro tour. And if you're not going to use your sponsor sleeves, then you can use the ones they give you. Season Pyromancer. Card's great. I actually kind of want to pick some of those up. They're like 17 bucks though, I think, now. 17 to 20 Should have picked them up when they were like 8 when they first came out. So many of these Modern Horizon cards were cheap when they came out. It's pretty funny. Like, people just didn't like predict what a lot of these cards were going to do. Ranger Captain of Eos card is awesome. This is why I want to make this Mardu deck. Okay, he's playing Tide Hollow Skuller, which uh, the version that I first saw of this deck did not play Tide Hollow Skuller. I'm not sure if it makes the deck better or not. Is effectively just another uh, thought seize, but it's tied to the tide hauler scholar. So if the tide hollow scholar dies, they get the card back, which is why he took lightning bull out of his hand because he had tide hollow scholars. So he's gonna take his other tarmogoyf. Oh, he drew Colgon's command. That was a good draw. He's probably going to Kologon's Command, deal 2 damage to the Tide Hollow, and have his opponent discard a card. That would be the two modes I would choose. Yep. Gets rid of Ranger Captain because I don't think he can cast it. Cracks his mistress bobble, looks at his opponent's top card. He's got unearth. Okay, he can unearth the ranger captain. That would actually be good. Or play tide hollow schooler. Yeah, he's going to do that and thought sees. Although he's at a pretty low life total, so he needs to be careful here. Or no, he's going to go get a um, death shadow. So he took three damage from getting the ranger captain back. He's going to play the Death Shadow. The Death Shadow is going to be an 
and Bloodstained Mire. Okay. He probably just safely played Nil Spellbomb. And that actually is some good insurance for the Tarmogoyfs. Because he can shrink them down considerably. Especially if he targets himself. If he targets himself, they, they all become 2-3s. Because there's just land and instant in his opponent's graveyard. Play a spell bomb. Oh, he can win here. If he doesn't block, then he team or battle rages and just or he cracks shocks, team or battle rages and wins. Oh wait, is that a win? Yeah, it's 16 damage. Exactly. Oh, he didn't block. Boom, scoop him up. I think that was a slight misplay of his opponent. I mean, it's not a good position for his opponent either way, but I think you tr you triple block there. Actually, no. He was forced. He he, he couldn't do anything. Because if he triple blocked, he would have just nil spell bombed, and all three Tarmogorgs would have died. So. Either way, he was, I think he was just forced into a, a bad position. And Tron, another Tron player. Tron seems to be doing pretty well. Alright, game two. Turn one spell bomb. Wow, that is a... Look at the text on that card. It goes all the way to the casting cost. Wow. Tide Hollow. <laughs> the zoom in doesn't always work. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, probably gonna take the Pyromancer here, right? Maybe the maybe the Inquisition, yeah, Pyromancer. A swamp on a blood crypt. I 
Oh yeah, because he needs double red for Pyromancer if he draws one. Yeah. The Death Shadow player's hand is just stacked. It looks like this Mardu version isn't playing Dreadhorde Arcanist. I haven't seen him... I've seen him play two matches so far, and he hasn't... Or, like, one and a half matches. And he doesn't look like he has Dreadhorde Arcanist in this build. It looks like he's playing Tide Hall's Hollow Skuller instead. And I don't know if he has Giver of Runes either. The other version was playing two Giver of Runes. It looks like this one is just designed to just get a big Death Shadow out and Teamer Battle Rage. It looks like he's got multiple Teamer Battle Rages in it. A double path. Push those into the camera. We want, we want the audience to see what's exiled. <laughs> He's going to crack the explosives on the instep, get his pyromancer back, play his pyromancer on his turn. Hopefully draw a non-land card that he can discard, maybe like a hand destruction. Draw another two cards. Unfortunately, he drew land. But he's going to just, just straight up draw two cards. He doesn't get any elementals out of it, but he gets to draw two cards. Always good. And he draws a nether pyromancer. Nice. The value. Dude, look at this season pyromancer. Look how hot he is. Dude, look at it. No pun intended. He's like, a, like, he's like the Fabio of, of Pyromancy. Look at this guy. Fabio. Those, those rock hard abs, his chest like bursting out of his little, little cloth tunic. Alright, Ranger Captain into Death Shadow. That was the best top deck he could have gotten.
Oh, Kalidus. Can you do anything with Kalidus? Kalidus is death touch, so... I can kill the, uh... Death Shadow, but unfortunately I think he has Teamer Battle Rage in his hand, which gives it double strike, so... That's gonna negate the possibility of death touching. Huh. Cause a street wraith, gross. And he has a fetch land. And another death shadow. So he can go down to four, which makes his death shadow nine nine. Does he just win straight up? Yeah he does. He's got what, six, eight toughness? Yeah, that's eleven damage it's gonna get through. Teamer battle rage on big death shadow, hard to prevent. You gotta have lots of removal to kill their death shadows. I guess this is just the version, this is the, re, you know, the point of this deck. Is just to get a Death Shadow and Teamer it. Yep, 10 damage exactly. He got him exactxies both times. Bummer. It's a bummer. I feel like the Jund deck is, is a good matchup for that deck, too. Well, at least the old Jund was w with more removal. That guy's Jund did not have very much removal. Maybe that other player that we saw before would have been better suited. Here's another Urza. Urza Thopter Sword, which is really just a prison deck with Urza in it. I guess this is more just suited to get the combo out as fast as possible. So it's not quite a, a prison deck, even though it runs some prison cards. Like Pithing Needle and Snaring Bridge. Yeah, I guess it only runs a few. Ooh, Dredge. We haven't seen Dredge all tournament. Looks like Dredge is playing like one Hogak main now. Just for the ability to like, you know, cast it from your graveyard. And it's just a huge like... 8 8 trampler that like can get around certain decks like tokens and stuff. But all in all, it looks about the same as it always has. Oh, it dropped one prized amalgam for Hogak. It's just like straight up all enablers, this version is. Four Shriek Horns. I've never seen one with four Shriek Horns. Yeah, it's just running all the enablers for Dredge. Only two Golgari Thugs. Is that new? I thought it ran four Golgari Thugs. I guess it's running Shriekhorn over that. That's really crazy though, running only three Apprised Amalgams. That's really crazy to me. That must be what they took out for Hogak. To a Reality Smasher. Okay, he's playing Eldrazi Tron. Draws another Esper Charm. Makes him discard his last two cards. Esper Charm's super cool. It's either, it's like three modes. Draw two cards, your opponent discards two cards, or destroy target enchantment, I believe, is the third mode.
It's really strong, though. Yeah, that ceremonial rejection is not going to do anything against the Eldrazi, at least, since he's got Cavern of Souls out. He can, however, hit like a walking ballista with it. Or an all his dust. Although he probably boarded those out against him. Ooh, he's gonna ceremonial rejection that. Chalice on one, yeah. That's gonna get countered. He's like, do I, do I put it in the graveyard? He's like, yeah. <laughs> yes. He draws a path. That's exactly what I needed. He needs to get that Reality Smasher off the board. He's going to have to discard a card to do it, but, I mean... Probably going to discard the Logic Knot. Logic Knot's not super good right now with the Cavern on the board. But then again, the Walking Ballista is a huge threat, too. He's probably going to... Um, path, snap path. Maybe during his upkeep. So he can't use the lands. Yep, during his upkeep, he's going to path the walking ballista. And I'm sure Sure, he's gonna pump it and then deal three to him. Or deal at least two to him and then get the land out of it. I don't know how many basics this deck runs. How many wastes? Probably two or three, maybe. Okay, he's gonna do all to his face, so he's not gonna get a land out of this. He was just targeting the, the, the path. He wasn't using it. Yeah, he's going to get rid of the Logic Knot, like I thought. And then his last card is an Esper Charm, so he can draw it. He can two for one. Oh, I kind of wanted to watch the rest of that. I hate when they do that. Urza versus Dredge. We have yet to see this matchup. Actually, we have yet to see Dredge yet. We have seen the Urza deck a few times, and it's very strong. Just a really fast combo deck that is hard to attack. Without sideboard hate. Obviously, the ideal card against it is Stony Silence. It pretty well shuts it down. Not being able to activate any of its artifact abilities. It's like he's going to Nature's Claim the Shriekhorn. Before he can use it a second time.
play Blood Crypt, get Blood Gas back. And loot again. Still no dredgers in the graveyard. Alright, well, you got a craft digger's cage. Wait, this is this game two? Oh, this must be the same round. Yeah, this is still round 13. We're just watching another match. Alright, I got the uh, Graft Digger's cage off with Ancient Grudge. It's like Urza's missing land drops, which is definitely good for the Dredge player. Since he doesn't really have anything going, he still has zero Dredgers in his graveyard. This is one of the setbacks if you if you're not playing the full amount of dredgers. He's not playing two uh, of the dredge four creatures. He took those out for um, what looks to be shriek horns because he's playing four shriek horns, which I've never seen that build for dredge before. I've seen like a couple shriek horns, but never four. Um, taking out two Golgari th or uh, two uh, of the dredge four thugs. I've never seen that before. They always play four thugs, four stinkweed. You know, four life from the loam. Alright, he finally found a stinkweed. It's like both decks are kind of stumbling, not really doing what they want to do. Like, partly because of sideboard cards. They both drew, like, sideboard cards, like Leyline of the Void, and the Urza deck drew, you know, Graft Diggers and something else. Uh, Nature's Claim. So when you sub in sideboard cards, your deck loses the cards that make it your deck. He's stumbling on lands pretty hard. He's missed like two land drops now. I mean, it looks like he has all the components. Yeah, he has Urza, he has the Opter Foundry, and the swords in the graveyard, but... I 
Alright, he's gonna get the Grab Digger's Cage back. Yeah, that Goblin Engineer is super, super strong. Creeping chill. The dredge player could straight up win. He's just he's just been beating down with a blood gas. And hers is at eight now. Yeah, if he keeps missing land drops. He keeps missing land drops. He's just gonna straight up lose to like beat downs. Hard casting the uh, stink weeds. He right, drew a mox opal that he can't use. Who creeping chill? Yeah, he can't stop the creeping dude. He's on a one turn clock or a two turn clock now. He's just straight. I'm gonna kill him with creeping chill. The card's so good. I can't believe they made Creeping Chill. It's insane. He's got three 1-1 one -one flyers out. He just needs two of them to survive to attack. Wow, this is insane. This is actually hilarious. Like, he straight up is going to lose here. To Creeping Chills and, like, one Blood Ghast and stink hard cast Stinkweed Imps. That's funny. Oh, he's gonna nature's claim his own star, so he gains four life. Okay. So that's gonna buy him one turn. Oh, he draws a land. Okay, it's a fetch land though. Although, if he gets another Creeping Chill, it's over. Yeah, he's got two creeping chills left in the deck, so chances are pretty good that he's just going to win on his next turn. Although, does he get the infinite combo here? Can he play Urza? Yeah, he might just win on his. The Urza might just win on his next turn. Oh, he's cycling Forgotten Cave. To dredge stinky. No, dredge stinky. Dredge stinky. What are you doing? I think that was a mistake.
Yeah, that was a mistake. He should have dredged Stinkweed Imp. Because I think Urza, he's just going to win on his turn now. Yeah, he's got all the pieces. He just has to play Urza and then do all his tricks. Yeah, he's got it, I think. He just makes infinite thopters. It's over. Gains infinite life. Has infinite thopters. Yeah, GG. Yeah, he should have dredged five. He had. A, he would have had a better chance to get a creeping shell. If he hit creeping shell, he's gonna hate himself if he looks at the top two cards and there's a creeping shell in the top two cards. That's that's all I gotta say. Is this round 14? Yes, it is. Tron, Eldrazi Tron versus Jund. Ooh, Jund's getting all the bad matchups. <laughs> but turn one Inquisition, see what he can get. Probably going to take the Chalice of the Void here. That's pretty much his only play. I mean, dismember, but he's got two of them, so he's probably not going to take a dismember. Unless he doesn't want him to remove his creatures, but I think Chalice of the Void is the grab here. Jund has a lot of one-drops, at least 12 one-drop cards. Yeah, he's going to take Chalice. third land. Ouch. Yeah, he he assuredly kept that hand because he knew he was going to turn two Chalice of the Void on one, which is good against a lot of the decks in the meta right now. But, yep, the hand destruction just plucked it right out of his hand. Thwarted those plans. Oh, nice top deck. Thought not coming in hot. He's playing Matter Reshaper? How would you play Matter Reshaper here? I think that was a huge misplay. Like, you definitely want to see what your opponent's working with and take their best card. Like, 100%. Now he's going to get Thought Seized out of his hand. Wow, that was a terrible, terrible play. Okay, he's going to 100% take the Thought Knot. Like, matter. Like, why would you play Matter Reshaper? It's a three. Like, it's not even that good of a creature. Like, I don't. Oh, he's taking Dismember? What? He wants him to play Thought Knot? Okay, that's bizarre. He's got a... He's doing it to, like, protect his Tarmogoyf? I don't really know why. He has no removal for the Thought Knot. I don't know why he wouldn't take Thought Knot there. That's, uh... Pretty weird. Because he's definitely going to Thought Knot and take his Blood Braid. Oh, it's because he wants to Surgical Extract the Dismember, that's why. So he gets a, uh, a two-for-one with the uh, Surgical. I don't know. I don't know. I still don't know if I agree with that. 
I feel like the thought knot's just better. Especially since he can't get rid of it. Yeah, he only, there was only two dismembers in the deck. I mean, he did it to just get it out of his hand, but, like, I don't think that was a good play. I'm just gonna take the blood breath and now and now he's just left with a lightning bolt <laughs> like what he's got I mean he's got the peat land to like cycle but yeah I think that was a really bad play like not only does he take his best card he also has perfect information now and how big is that goif it's a uh, Instant sorcery land artifact, so it's a four five, yeah. I mean if he attacks with Goyf, he's just not gonna block it. Why would he? Oh, he drew. Wow, that was a lucky top deck. He drew Assassin's Trophy off of the peat, the peat land. So I guess he wasn't punished too hard for his bad line. But I mean, now he can play all his dust. No, you can't play a land, buddy. You already played one. Oh, you're cheating. He played a land already. He played the peat land. Yeah. Stop cheating, bro.
Yeah, I would have fired off that all's vest too. I mean, you know your opponent's on nothing. How he draws Liliana. That was a pretty nice top deck. Well, he's got a million mana now. He draws a uh, walking blow, so that's GG. He should have just played the land in his hand. There's no reason to hold on to it against Liliana. He knows Liliana's going to take up. Tony draws Tracker. Dude, this guy's so lucky. the best possible two draws in a row he could get. Or three draws, because he got he drew Assassin's Trophy first, and then he drew Liliana, then Tireless Tracker. So he draws another Tireless Tracker. Wow. Well, at least he's going to get Blast on him away. He needs to get, like, something big here, though. He needs, like, a Walking Ballista or... <clears throat> that 6-drop Eldrazi that's super, super strong. Now he's drawing more lands. The Flood is real. I think he just got a pop-off Blast Zone right now. Yeah, he draws another Liliana. Wow. Got seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So he could walking ballista for six and win. He needs a mocking ballista. That's pretty much all he can top deck to win here. Because he's just not going to get out from under this value. Like, no way.
All right, what he should do here is fatal push the matter reshaper and then tick down Lily or tick up Lily. Okay, which he didn't do. Lionstone. That chalice. All is dust, that's good. <laughs> he must have thought he must have forgot that he sacrificed a clue. Yeah, he must have forgot he sacrificed a clue or he would have killed that. Oh, and he gets Karn off of that. Wow. Is Tron just coming back hard? Renin Six is not gonna do anything. This is the only problem with running six when you draw him like late game. He's just not very impactful. I mean, he can give back a cycle land, redraw. I mean, this guy guess that's decent, but. Oh, he drew a scoos. But I think it's just over, isn't it? He can gain one life. Does he have a walking ballista in his sideboard? If he has a walking ballista in his sideboard, this game's over. He's got effectively four life with the scavenging ooze. Yeah, he must be counting up mana. Yeah, he's got enough. If he has a walking bliss, this is over. Alright, reality smasher. Yeah, he way overthought this. <laughs> All he had to do was get the walking... Wait, what? He's getting Mycosynth Lattice? This guy is terrible. Dude, you're terrible. What are you doing? Ugh. This guy's made so many play errors. Actually, both players have, but like... Damn, bro. Learn, learn math, man. Learn some addition subtraction. He can only gain one life. Maybe he thought he could gain two life, but there was a fetch land. So he's not gaining... He's only effectively gaining one life, so he'd be at four. Which means he could have just gotten the Ballista with Karn and just killed him. Alright, game two. Good hand. I'm gonna take. It's gonna take the map. Yeah, he just doesn't want him to get Tron, I guess. Now <laughs> he draws another map. The top decks. It's always fun to be to be be on hand destruction and like take some card out of someone's deck and then they play the same card. So you just know for sure that they just top-decked it. That's pretty funny.
It's not fun for the person playing hand destruction, but yeah. It was ghost quartering the Tron land and then surgicaling it. So the surefire. Oh, and he gets that out of his hand too. Yeah, he knew there was one in his hand also. Surefire way to prevent that Tron. Actually, Urza. Urza can get that card from exile because it's outside of the game. Or Karn can. So if he Karn in minus two, he could grab one of those mines. He could grab any of those mines or the cards in his sideboard. That's what's designated outside the game. It's not any card. Like, originally it was any card, like, in your collection. Like, if you had, like, a box of cards, you could be like, oh, box of cards, I'm just going to grab some card that I own outside the game. But they, like, restricted it. I don't know when they actually restricted it to just be cards in exile and cards in your sideboard. It was years ago, but I know at one point it was any card. Like you could bring us that you could have like your card box with you and like your binder. This was a long time ago, but yeah. And it's usually just like anti cards that said stuff like that, like way back in the day. But I think there were actually like cards that let you do that like at some point and you could actually get any card you wanted uh, for a brief period of time. All right, he's got the Ophi. Ophi's gonna shut off all artifact abilities. He's got some options here. You can put out Fulminator or Tracker or Lily. See what the best play would be. Maybe just Tracker. Or Fulminator. Fulminator kill Eldraz Eldrazi Temple. That might be the play. I mean, he can't let him play Karn. Or I guess Eldrazi Temple doesn't let him produce two. He could... Mm, I don't know. It's hard to say what's the best play here. I mean, he is taking damage. I mean, he's going to take six next turn, so, like... It might just be Fulminator here. Kill the temple. And then next turn he can start dealing with the reshapers. I don't know. If he top decks a land and plays Karn, it's going to be very difficult to win from there. Yeah, he's going to play Fulminator. Probably kill the temple. Oh, he's not. He's just going to have a blocker. Okay. 
Well, now he's going to get punished. Karn is coming out. I think you just get walking ballista here. Actually, I would have attacked first and see if he see if he uses the fulminator mage or not, and then I would have used Karn's ability. He's getting liquid metal coating. So liquid metal coating lets him turn anything into an artifact. Maybe he's trying to lock his mana down. He didn't attack him last turn either, like, what? I just do not know what, what is going on in this Tron player's head. Alright, is he gonna get walking ballista? Swing at Lily and shoot her for the last point? I think that might be pretty good. <clears throat> Judge. 
Yeah, he went and got blocking ballista. Okay, he blocked. And sacked. To kill tower. Okay. And he fetched a blast zone in response to his land being destroyed from the expedition map. And now he's going to play blast zone. Or maybe not. Yeah, he's going to play blast zone. Another Ophi. Not the greatest here. Alright, Mystic Forge, this is a new card out of M20. It lets you look at the top card and you can play the top card and then you can tap to pay a life and exile the top card. Oh, you can only cast it if it's an artifact or colorless non-land card. There's that stipulation, obviously. If you could cast any card, this card would be just the most busted thing ever. Why wouldn't you attack Liliana? He's trying. He's just like puts way too much value in this car, and I don't understand. Wait, so Tarmogoyf was a 5-6? Why would he attack with Tarmogoyf if he knew he had a, a Dismember in hand? I'm just... I, I, I'm, I'm without words commentating this match. There's been so many weird plays that like just do not make sense. I guess he values the scavenging ooze higher? I don't so an inbringer, yeah, this game's over.
brings us around 15. All right, what is this, Mardu? Death Shadow versus Jund, okay. Any, what, turn one, Bobbled and Nil Spellbombed. Turn two, Tide Hollow Skuller. Taking the push. Tide Hollow Skuller 101, you always take the thing that can remove the Tide Hollow Skuller before you take anything else because they'll just get their card back. So always take the removal first if you're using a Tide Hollow Skuller. Good rule of thumb. Probably just gonna jam run in six here, get his land back. It's really amazing how many cards gain value because of fetch lands. Like if fetch lands didn't exist, and really they didn't exist until like what? Zendikar, which is not a very old set. It's like maybe seven year, eight years old, seven years old. Like, so we, we played Magic for like 18, 19 years without fetch lands. And fetch lands just kind of like added this whole new, they really changed the game a lot. For better and for worse. Like, probably more better than worse. It lets you, you know, play more color decks. It, it allowed you to kind of branch out to three and four colors when before that was just not that viable. It was mostly two color decks before that at the most. But at the same time, it, it did bring problems to the game. Like, shuffling all the time, for example, adds a lot of time to games. Uh, there's probably a lot more draws now because of fetch lands. They just add, like, you know, a few minutes to a match. Uh, but mostly upside, I would say. But they also make it so these other, these, these cards that come out with interactions with lands and stuff, interactions with cards in graveyard, you know, delve, like all these you know, because it fills up the graveyard for free, basically. So you're getting all these, like, periphery effects from, from sack lands. Or fetch lands. You know, beyond just mana fixing. You're getting these additional benefits. Like Ren and Six. Like, Ren and Six would not be nearly as good if fetch lands didn't exist. Because you wouldn't, like, you know, how do you get lands to your graveyard at that point? It's very difficult. I mean, you could still use cycle lands, but you would have to get one in your hand first, cycle it, and then use Ren and Six. But now it's like anytime Ren and Six comes out, you can just always bring back your fetch land because everyone plays like, you know, eight to ten fetch lands at least in their modern deck. Sometimes more, sometimes less. But average around eight to ten fetch lands are in most modern decks, so. I think there's ten, at least 10 fetches in Jund, so chances are you're going to have a fetch land in your hand when you play Ren and Six, or in play rather.
Alright, Ranger Captain's going after Renin 6. He's just gonna let it die. Nil Spellbomb threatening to shrink the Tarmogoyf to a 1 2. Or a 0 1, actually, it would have been. Because he had no cards in his graveyard. Oh, another Tide Hollow Skull is going to take WoW and a Death Shadow. This is looking real bleak for Jund. Yeah, I think that's GG. He's flooding a little bit too. So I find another Death Shadow. Gross. Smack him for 10. So he's another Death Shadow. Go. Alright, smack him for 12. Those are 6-6 six, six Death Shadows. Like, there's no way out of this except for Damnation, and, and he does not have Damnation main deck. It's a sideboard card. It's kind of just going through the motions. There's no way he comes back from this. G to the G. Yeah, this is the crazy one with Golgari Queen in it. Oh, he is playing one Gurmag. I thought this wasn't playing any Gurmags. Oh, he's playing a Hex Parasite. <laughs> That's really funny. I wonder why the Hex Parasite's in there. Maybe for like the... Maybe he thought the... Uh, The Neoform deck was going to be bigger. Neoform relies on like undying creatures and like the minus one, minus one tokens from Yogmoth to do the infinite combo. I mean, it kills Planeswalkers too. Maybe it's because he thought he was going to fight against a lot of like Planeswalkers. I guess it's good against Ren 6 and like Lily and Jace and all the other Planeswalkers that are now being played in Modern. It's a spicy little one of.
All right, game number two. It's like no plays on turn one for either player. Oh, yeah, to damage yourself with no target? Yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, you can do that, too. That's pretty legit. Yeah, you can just put your life total down to, like, two. Or one. And just, like, yeah, this deck is really just tuned to, like, win with uh, Death Shadow and um, Kemer Battle Rage. It look like, looks like it's just fully tuned to just do that. Good call, Monoxide. Yeah, I guess you can target a permanent even if it doesn't have counters on it. Yeah, I remember when that card was in standard. It was actually like pretty decent if I remember correctly. I know there were like two planeswalker decks in those blocks. Like two Super Friends decks. There was a Gruel Super Friends and I think there was an Esper Super Friends deck. So Hex Parasite was like a really good sideboard card. Hey, thanks for the follow, Monoxide. I appreciate you. Welcome to the channel. I also love the fact that this deck can play four paths and four fatal push. It's just got the like disgusting removal suite. Just all one cost. And then path of course is like arguably the best removal in modern. I mean next to dismember. Dismember is like probably the best just because everyone can use it. But like if you can play white path is like the best removal. And then Fatal Push is like a close second, like for sure. True, and the Liliana tricks. Dude, that's so good. You can get Ranger back, and then Ranger fetches another Death Shadow. You just get a two for one anytime you bring a Ranger back. Very cool. Liliana the Last Hope is just a very, very good Planeswalker. She's used extensively in Legacy also.
Alright, we got Ranger and Death Shadow on board. Yeah, he's not even bothering with uh, Giver of Runes, I don't think. I mean, they put his deck up earlier. Yeah, I don't think he has Giver of Runes in there. And he definitely has no Dreadhorde Arcanist. He's got one Gurmag Angler. Ooh, there's Golgari Queen. Boom. Kill that Death Shadow. Yeah, it looks like the Jun player is just like doing what Jun does best. Just mitigating all the creatures. Getting value. He's got three clues in play. You got Ren and Six threatening ult in a couple turns. I think it's going to be extremely difficult for the Death Shadow player to come back. Ooh, Hex Parasite. Let's go. Kill those Planeswalkers. <laughs> so good. I'll probably just kill Vraska. Yeah. Alright. He's Hellbent. But he's got Hex Parasite out, so he can go down to 2 life. Make his Death Shadows 11 11s. If he draws a team or battle rage right here, he just wins, doesn't he? I guess he's got a bunch of clues he can crack. If he if he finds removal, he needs to find removal here. Okay, he's got a fatal push in hand. He needs to find another removal. Yeah, just get rid of that Hex Parasite right now. Don't want to deal with that. <laughs> Dude, Ren and Six is so good. Card is bonkers. Alright, he's going to Fatal Push 1. Get another clue. Start cracking clues. Yeah, that thing is a 7-7. Seven, seven. You will not be able to kill that. Oh, he only wants him to have one draw step. Oh, the artifact in the graveyard. Boom, takes six. Boom! Tricked him. Dude, he tricked, he baited him hard. But, I mean, I think he was dead either way, because he could have cracked three clues. Yeah, he just, he was dead either way. Both of his creatures could do, had six power, if he wanted. That was, that was well played. He saw the line. I didn't realize that the, the Tarmogorp was a 6-7 either. But, it was right after the artifact got killed, it became a 6-7.
was that Hogak versus the Esper? You know, I'm kind of surprised that people aren't playing more Settle the Wreckage for this deck. I guess it wasn't really on people's radar that this was going to be a big deck. Like, 25% of the field is playing Hogak. That's a lot. That's a huge percentage. Because, yeah, these, like, Supreme Verdicts and stuff don't really do that much against this deck. It just gets all its creatures back again. Because Grave Crawler, you can just keep recasting Grave Crawler, so like you're always gonna keep getting your Venge Vines back. All right, what do we got? Alright, game three. These have been good games, too. I love the grindy mid range battles. Ooh, he's got Gurmag. Are we going to see a Gurmag? Unfortunately, this deck can't play Gurmag as fast as Grixis because they have. Grixis has Thought Scour, which is like pretty key in getting it out to on turn two but even a turn three Gurmag is like respectable Unearth is so good. I love that card. It's either Unearth or Tide Hall of Skuller. Oh, he's taking Kologon's command. Okay. I guess he's got multiple removal. Yeah, looks like he's got Abrupt Decay and Bolt for Tide Hollow. I think the only red card in this deck is Team or Battle Rage. It's basically just a black-white deck with red splash for Team or Battle Rage. Because it's not playing Dreadhorde Arcanist like the previous version was. And it's not playing Lightning Bolt. So it's just splashing the red for Team or Battle... Oh, and Kologon's Command. Yeah, of course. Yeah, who needs Lightning Bolt when you have Path and Fatal Push, you know? I take the Lightning Bolt here, don't you? Why does he take the Goyf? Okay. I don't really see the point of that because he's going to get bolted, but okay.
is a nice top deck. Path to Exile. Probably going to path that. Actually, path is kind of bad, actually, because he knows his opponent doesn't have a third land. It would have been much better if he had a, a Fatal Push. Alright, he cycled on Earth. Yeah, I don't think he's playing any Faithless Lootings either. I think it's just like two Cologons Command and four Teamer Battle Rage. He's just going to take the damage. It's getting dangerous, though. Yeah, he can't play the Ranger of Eos here. I think he's going to play the Gurmag, yeah. And he's going to bolt the Tide Hollow Scholar on the end step. Get the Goyf back. Probably play the Goyf. Yeah, that Gorf's a 5-6, too, because Tidehall of Skuller is an artifact creature. So that's, like, the worst card that could be in the graveyard right now. That thing's outclassing Gurmag Angler right now. So what I think he should do is play Nil Spell Bomb. And then attack. For five. And then if he double blocks, he can path one of them and the other one just dies. Or he's just going to use it right now. Okay, shrunk the shrunk the trauma glove two or three four. Yeah, I like I like what he did there. He also made it so the scavenging goose couldn't eat the last creature and get bigger.
too. A lot, a lot of good choices here. I think you should have. I don't know. He probably takes the path here. It's either the path or the ranger captain. Maybe the ranger captain is a better choice. Okay, he's going to take path. I guess he doesn't care much about the uh, the death shadow he's going to get with the ranger captain because he can abrupt decay it, but... Oh, he's got another Inquisition. Okay. He's going to take the Ranger Captain now. 100%. Actually, what he should have done is Collector Brutality and Inquisitioned. Collector Brutality, I guess, has other modes that might be decent. He let him keep the ranger captain, that's interesting. No, he just top decks lightning bolt. Well, GG. That works. I think he navigated it pretty well though. I think both players played really well, all three of those games. Well, let's look at the conversion rates. 21% of the field playing Hogak, 21.5, 4.4. Phoenix, 10.5, Eldrazi, Tron, 9.2, Humans, 8.3. Let's look at the conversion rate. I like the conversion rate, all right. So, Hogak went from 21.4 to 24 percent of day two, so it gained. It climbed what 2.8 percent. 0.2 for Phoenix. 0.5 for Tron. Uh, same amount for Blue White Control. Humans dropped. Jun dropped. Burn went up 0.3. Dredge 0.1. Tron went down 0.7. Urza went down 0.7, Monoroid 0.1, 0.1 for Hogak Dredge. Boggles went up 0.3. That's I mean this this data isn't doesn't really tell you very much. I mean three percent I guess is pretty compelling for Hogak, but there also were the most of them playing. So like I don't know. If that's actually like relevant. All 
Alright, this is... Oh, no, this is still round 15. This is a time walk match. We can watch this. There's only one round left. It's, uh... Hogak versus humans. Yelger. Uyghursma. Uyghursma. Alright, so he's got two graph diggers out. It's kind of stopping what, uh... <laughs> Pampero. Um... Bullet Metal. Tengoku is like the best part, is the best place to farm it. So again, we see here sideboard cards replacing, you know, cards that win the game. So the humans is not, not, you know, very quick out of the gates. It's just playing a disruptive plan. But regardless, he still plays Hogak on turn, what is that, two? I don't know, it's turn three. Yeah, turn three Hogak with Gravecrawler and Stitcher Supplier. Looks like the humans player didn't draw a third land, so he can't reflect or mage the Hogak. Not looking good for humans. <laughs> He's got to take care of that Hogak really quickly. Because it is an 8 8 trample. Yeah, he didn't draw a third land. He's he's pretty screwed. I guess he can team block Hogak. And lose his entire board.
GG. Yeah, he's like, Reflector Mage, that would have gotten the job done. <laughs> That's a bummer. We got, what is that, two? Those are both Hogak decks. That's a Tron deck. David Mines, what's he on? Is he on? He might be on, uh, Jund. Manuel Lins, I don't know what he's on. Sean Gifford, don't know what he's on. Probably, one of them's probably on Kogak. We got Giamo though. Boom, Esper Control. Let's go. Looks like that other Frenchman did not do well today. Ooh, Reed Duke. The Duke. Duke could top eight if he gets if he wins the last one. Although shit, is it gonna take thirteen three to top eight now? All right, so two of these are gonna be thirteen. Well, uh, if they split, if they all split, uh, twelve three and one. So if these guys all split. And these guys all split. Maybe just one twelve and three gets in, or one twelve and four. And then one of these guys wins. Actually, if one of these guys wins, no twelve and four get in. It, it's kind of weird. There might be like one or two twelve and fours that get in. But before twelve, a bunch of twelve and fours used to get in. But I think the pro tours have less people in them now, or the Magic Mythic Championships have less people, so it's harder to get. You need a better record for top eight now, essentially, than you did like last year or like any of the previous years. All right, this is round 16. Hogak versus Mono Red Phoenix. Okay, we haven't seen Mono Red Phoenix yet. This deck's pretty cool. It's more of like a burn type strategy, but it does play four Phoenix and it plays like, you know, Four Swift Spear, four Soul Scar Mage. It plays all these prowess creatures and just chains a bunch of spells and just does a bunch of direct damage. And hopefully gets there. Okay, that's not a good start for the Mono Red Phoenix deck. He definitely wanted like a Swift Spear or a Soul Scar. <laughs> Turn to Hogak. That's disgusting. And a French vine. God, this deck is insane. Yeah, there's like nothing he can do. This is just over.
Like, honestly, the only thing that disrupts this deck from doing this crap on turn two is Leyline of the Void. Like, Leyline of the Void is literally the only counterplay to, like, a turn two Hogak slash other creatures spewing out onto, their t onto the table. Like, there's nothing else that stops it. Like, no, you know... If they're on the play, there's nothing else that stops it. That seems a, a bit oppressive to me. That there's no counterplay to it. It's kind of unhealthy. For a format. Like, in Legacy, that's fine. Because they, you know, there's free counter magic. There's days and there's force of will. So they definitely need to do something about this deck. This deck is just... I mean, Dredge can do some pretty nasty things on turn 2, too. But nothing like this. Absurd. Turn three, he's got two Vengevine, Blood Gas, Grave Crawler, Carrion Feeder, Stitcher Supplier, and Hogak on table. Okay. That's fair. deck. Dude, the second I saw Hogak, I was like, this card, someone's gonna break this card. Like, I knew it. I knew it. Like, Delve Convoke? I was like, no. You do not put Delve Convoke on a huge trample creature that can also be cast from the graveyard. Like, no. Like, I think that was a really just, like, like, R&D just dropped the ball big time. Like, they should have realized that, like, the meta right now is so graveyard intensive that, like, making that creature was just a fucking bad idea, and it was a bad idea. Really bad idea. I guess Relic of Progenitus has some counterplay. But 
But I mean, like, in a situation like this, Relic of Regenitus, if he put a Hogak into the graveyard right there, and he had six cards to delve and two to convoke, Relic of Regenitus would not be able to stop him from playing that Hogak, because priority would still be his. Tonight he chose to target the Tron player with the Hedron Crab effect. Alright, now he's going to use it because if he flips a Hogak, he can't stop it. He has to do it in response to him playing Seder Wayfinder. <laughs> that was a lucky top rip. Obviously, he's going to take the Ulamog that he would have been able to slam. Just windmill slam that thing next turn. That was a super, super lucky top deck, Ben White. through this. These guys are playing really fucking slow. Okay, it looks like he board wiped with the bow stone and then used relic and cleared the graveyards again. The relic that was in his hand. Yeah, 
don't know why. You got all lands in your hand, bro. Hurry the F up. And you got nothing going on either. You guys are playing so slow. It's really obnoxious. judges to be like make a fucking decision bro all right this is the good this will be quick <laughs> soul scar mage turn one this is game two He's waiting. He's going to play the other Soul Scar Mage. Yeah, he just wants to get like maximum prowess value. Yeah, he's going to he's going to get at least plus 2 plus 2 to everything. Next turn. Hopefully he can outpace him. Hope that he doesn't play a Hogak. Oh, but he's got a Hogak in hand. Yeah, that's disgusting. If you get two fetch lands, a one drop creature and a Seder Wayfinder, you can play Hogak. There's so many, like, turn two Hogak plays. Oh, wait, no, he can just do it with one fetch land. Oh, yeah, Hogak only costs seven. That is absurd. This is so absurd. What an absurd card. Like, why did they make that card? I just don't get it. I do not get it. They're like, oh, we'll ban Alter. That'll shut the deck down. Oh, wait, no. This version's, like, just as good. <laughs> Oh, R&D. Oh, magic R&D. How bad you are at balancing things. Alright, he's got two... Oh, sick. He's gonna get a phoenix back. Does he just win here? Bolt to face. Yeah, that's enough to kill him, right? Yeah, he's gonna take. Oh no, it's gonna put him to one. Bummer. Although I don't think he can do 18 points of damage to him. Oh, that's just two Venge Vines, actually. He could feasibly... The Hogak player could feasibly still win this. And this was, like, one of the best, like, starts this Mono Red deck could have gotten, too.
Yeah, he needed Venge Vines to win that. Yeah, let's see what they're working with. Oh, it still plays Ultra of Dementia. I guess it's just to, like, mill itself. Yeah, they just basically replaced Bridge from Below with Seder Wayfinder, and it just enables the, like, engine even better now. You just don't have an infinite combo. This guy's playing double Ulamog. I guess double Ulamog's pretty standard. Yeah, this, this is the new list. Apparently they're all playing four Worm Coils now. Because of Hogak, I assume. And Triple O-Stone. Did it always play Triple O-Stone? It might have. Three Relic of Progenitus main is new, though. That's for... I like it. Three Walking Ballistas. Yeah, I like this new build of Tron. Alright, so he got Leyland of the Void. Turn or game one or turn one. Before game starts, rather. And uh, he thought seizes him, takes the map. Which is a good take. That's obviously what you take. Alright, he's missing mine. Alright, well, the Hogak deck definitely can't do much when there's a Leyline of the Void, but that's like pretty much the only effective way of stopping it, which is why like everyone's playing like four Leyline of the Void in their sideboard, which is kind of stupid. Oh, boom. Double Worm Coil? Okay. 
Looks like Tron's got this one well in hand. I mean, it serves you right getting shut down by one card, Mr. Disgusting Graveyard Deck. Do I compete? Uh, yeah, I've played in like, what, like six or seven Grand Prix? Uh, I've day twoed like four of them, I think. And I played in a bunch of PPTQs, and uh, I've done some of the, uh, and I've played PTQs before too, and uh, the new, what are they called now? The, uh, Mythic Championship Qualifier, MCQs? I'm going to play in one of those actually really soon. There's a, there's a modern one at the shop that I play at coming up in a few weeks. I'll play in that. And there's also a Grand Prix in the... Uh, they have a Grand Prix every year here in my state. I always go to that one. And then sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll go to like one that's out of state. I played in one Star City Open, but that was before they stopped coming to the West Coast. So I don't play in those because they're only on like the East Coast now in like Middle America. I'm not gonna like fly. This looks like some serious business business. <laughs> yeah, this is the Mythic Championship. This is like the highest level of magic competition, basically. You have to get an invite to go to this turn. I've never been to a, to one of these before. You have to either top eight a Grand Prix, or they're called Magic Fest now, or win a Pro Tour qualifier or MCQ. Um, and those are the two ways to get on the Pro Tour, or to get invited to one of these. Alright, game three. We got turn one Crit Breaker. Okay, he molded the five, so that's good for the red player. I should stream my journey when I compete. That might be pretty hard. First off, I don't know if you're allowed to like film when you're at a Magic Fest. I think only like their people are allowed to film. I mean, you could you could film like outside of the main tournament hall probably. They can't like, you know, enforce that. But I don't think you can form you can um film inside the actual room where the tournament's being where it's taking place alright we have double double swift spear and soul scar mage he's setting up to do a really big turn three yeah he's got light. he's got two light up the stage Okay, if he gets a damage spell, if he draws a damage spell here, it's going to be disgusting. He's going to be able to prowess three times or more. Enigmate? Uh, I don't know who won because we're this is day two, not the top eight. So no spoilers, please, if you've already watched the top eight. have all the videos on their on their twitch channel you can just look in their videos this is this is their day two video that we're watching right now all right so he got okay he drew the lava spike awesome 
So now he's going to be able to light up the stage. Pre combat. Nice, and he's going to get a land off of it. Probably play another light up the stage. I think you should just light up the stage again. Oh, he's choosing not to light up the stage again. That's really interesting. He brought in Ley Lines of the Void against Mono Red. I don't think Ley Lines of the Void are good against Mono Red. Like, the only thing it, it takes care of are Phoenixes. Like, it doesn't really rely on its great... I mean, Faithless Looting Flashback, but, like, I don't think Ley Lines good enough to board in against Mono Red Phoenix, to be honest. I think that's a poor sideboarding choice. I think the strength of your deck relies in you just like outpacing them. And playing Hogak like that. I mean, Hogak's a huge like roadblock. And now he's got three big blockers. Well, the zombie's not big, but two big blockers that are probably going to kill whatever they block. Alright, he's going to start by playing light up the stage. Okay, if he blocks the three biggest things. Oh, he's not going to attack? I mean, he would have pushed, what, three, four, five damage, got him to five? Hmm, I wonder... I wonder if that was the right choice. I think he maybe should have just attacked there.
I think you should have lit up the stage the turn before. And that would have allowed him to draw an extra card off of the canopy land. It would have allowed him to play the swift spear before combat. Or before he played any spells. And then depending on what he draws here, if his top deck draw is like a good card, like a Faithless Looting or something like that, then he could have bought, he could have won last turn if he had lit up the stage the turn before. Like hard casting light up the stage is never where you want to be. So let's I'm interested in what this card is right here. It is a Faithless Looting. Oh my god. He fucked up so hard. He would have been in such better shape right now if he had played the the faithless or the light of the stage the turn before last. Wow. Live and learn, buddy. Live and learn. Yeah, there's no way he's gonna like get the damage now. Last turn was his last chance to like win this game. Or like get close enough to win the game to where he could like maybe finish him off with like a lightning bolt or something. But he's just not going to get there with creatures. There's too many blockers. He's going to get through with one guy and then lose to the, to the swing back. He's like a manamorphose into a manamorphose into a. He needs a lot of shit. Yeah, see, and then he drew another light up the stage. I think he could have won last turn. I think he could have won last turn. He needs to get, what, Lightning Bolt? Actually, will Lightning Bolt even do it for him? Yeah, Lightning Bolt will do it. If he gets Lightning Bolt here, he wins. Oh, Manamorphose. Oh, no, he played a land. Nope, he's dead. I think he would have won if he had lit up the stage two turns ago. I think he would have won. I think he would have got there. Bummer. Yeah, he doesn't have enough. Yeah, he has to block two things. Carrion Feeder and Vengevine is what he has to block. And then hope that he can piece together a win with his three remaining guys. What is he doing? Do not team block. Just the Carrion Feeder, bro. Yeah, just the Carrion Feeder. That's like, you gotta go, oh wait, no, that's 10 damage, never mind. He has to block three things. Actually, he should team block that. Yeah, his chance to win now is like super, super low, like super low. 
He has to hit like a crazy... Oh, that's a Manamorphose. Okay, double Manamorphose. Let's go. Did you just draw a third Manamorphose? What? Lightning Bolt? Oh my god, is he gonna do it? Oh my god, is he gonna do it? Is he gonna freaking do it? The trip Manamorphose? The trips? Uh, his opponent's like, what? His opponent's like, what? Are you actually going to win? Double lightning bolt? He wins! Oh my god, he wins! He freaking wins! Bolt both Seder Wayfinders, and he wins! Holy shit, dude. Oh my god. Dude, Yelger. How pissed is Yelger right now? He's like, dude, really? He's like, dude, really? Oh my god. Oh my god. Alright, why are you- what are you doing? You have the win, bro. Why are you trying to, like, get one more prowess? He didn't need to do that last prowess. That was just like kind of insult to injury right there. Dude, how lucky is this guy right here? How lucky is this guy right here? Oh my god. He totally misplayed too. I think he should have totally lit up the stage like two turns ago. I think he would have given himself a way better shot. I think he would have won a turn before, actually, too. But, oh my god, dude. Like, that's insane. He just triple Manamorphose into double Lightning Bolt. Like, it's, like, exactly what he needed. He had to remove both creatures. Like, that's insane. Holy crap. Holy crap. Are they going to even talk to that guy? No. Oh, we get to see the top eight. Let's see the top eight. Oh, so Hardened Scales got in. Tron got in. That guy's on Urza. Dude, he's a little person. Yes! Is this the first little person ever to top eight a fucking pro tour? That's awesome. Yes, go little people. Fuck yeah. Alright, so... We have... I don't know what this guy's on. He's on Hogak. He's on Mono Red Phoenix. He's on Jund. He's on Tron. He's on uh, Eldrazi Tron. He's on Hardened Scales. And he's on Urza. It's one of every deck. It's literally one of every deck. What? That's like unheard of. Like, that's crazy. It's one of every freaking deck. Unless this guy has. I don't know what deck this guy's on. I don't know what, uh, it's, if he has a different deck, it'll be one of every deck.
Okay, that's the Hardened Scales guy. I think it's Alan Wu. Was the last dude that I didn't know what deck he was on. Okay, Thoralf. Yes, dude. It's a great accomplishment. Getting a top eight at a, at a Mythic Championship is like the bet, the highest. Achievement you can make in magic. Well, worlds too, but yeah. Okay. It's the last guy that comes up. It's Alan Wu. Alright, whoops. Alright, what's he on? It's a. Uh, Dude, you got so lucky, dude. So lucky. <laughs> but that's pretty sweet. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> yes. Dude, that Tron player, dude, just fucking... Dude, he played, like, against, like... Or that that Jund player played against, like, three Tron players on freaking stream. And he, like, got there, dude. I gotta give it to him. Oh, Mueller! Martin Mueller. I think this is his first time. Mart Muller. Oh yeah, they're not gonna show his deck. Come on. We did all this to see this guy's deck. Yes. Fucking Sutcliffe's so tall, he's like six foot five. He's fucking towering over everyone. Damn it, they're not going to show his deck. Card of the day, Urza's is mine. I really wish they would, like, show the decks. Why don't they do that? Come on. Alright, that's the end. We did it. Uh, yeah, that wraps up day two of the Mythic Championship number four, Modern. Uh... This video is going to go up on my YouTube channel, which is lock underscore daddy, and you can watch it in scathing HD, 6,000 bitrate there. Uh, it's also going to be on my Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv slash lock underscore daddy. Uh, you should follow me on Twitter, which is lock underscore daddy one for any stream updates and what's going on in general in my life and other pop culture things. And yeah. We'll be back tomorrow for the top eight of the Mythic Championship 4, which is modern tomorrow. See you then.